So we are going to start this, uh, this session on translational vaccinology. So we have uh, five speakers today. Um, so each talk will be about 10 minutes and we'll take questions between the, the talks. So we won't have the uh, discussion at the end but because the topics are quite different. We'll, we'll take uh, questions between the, between the talks about for five minutes. Our next speaker is Anneke uh, Schroedenecker, which I promise I'm still not pronouncing Anneke's name properly, but, uh, from the Netherlands and she is at uh, Johnson Vaccine now. Okay. Good morning. Okay. It's my pleasure and privilege to present today on behalf of all our collaborators uh, for the first time data from a clinical study that we performed with a candidate uh, vaccine regimen. I declare uh, a conflict of interest. So as Glenda already pointed out, uh, we are trying to get a global HIV-1 prophylactic vaccine that will give protection against all circulating uh, HIV-1 variants around the globe. And for that, we think we need optimal immunity for which we have selected viral factors that can elicit these optimal immune responses and we are using the low seroprevalent adeno-26. We are also working with an uh, MVA, a pox factor that was originally uh, developed by uh, Bernie Moss and for this program uh, further developed by uh, Nelson Michael and Merlin Robb. We are using mosaic inserts for GAC, pol and ENV genes, and these were uh, designed by Bette Korber. And we are using a trimeric ENV protein for improved immunity, originally designed by Bing Chen. And if I would uh, say the other person that's involved in everything, I would be repeating myself 20 times, but that's Dan Baruch, front row. So uh, then with this, I acknowledge your very important contribution to this program. So in the end, we are aiming to bring forward the regimen that is shown in this slide. So we uh, will have a four-valent at 26-based double prime at uh, months zero and three, so two primes, that uh, express GAC-POL mosaic and ENV mosaic inserts. Then we aim for a double booster to get durable immune responses, and this will be a mix of the four-valent at 26 uh, vaccine co-formulated in uh, one to one to one to one ratio, combined with a uh, clade C protein and ultimately a clade C plus a mosaic protein to get full coverage, as I said, for all circulating strains. Boosts will be given at month six and 12 for durable responses. But at the time that we started all these studies, not all components were available. So we took off with what we had. And also at the time, we had not made our final selection of components that we needed to get these optimal immune responses. So at the time, we designed uh, a study, a parallel study that we were going to perform in non-human primates, where we could follow with challenge, and in, in humans, the so-called approach study. And the regimens that we tested was double priming with, at the time, a trivalent uh, adeno mixture and double boosting with either adeno mixture alone, adeno in combination with the clade C trimeric protein, protein alone, MVA alone, or MVA in combination with protein. And the scheme uh, shown here at the bottom was what I already mentioned you for the different doses that were given. So with uh, a preclinical study and a clinical study, we were hoping to uh, accumulate sufficient data to proceed for a proof of concept study. And that Traverse study here was included to uh, test the final components that we now have available. And I will give you a little bit more detail there. So first, the slide that Glenda already showed with very impressive uh, non-human primate data. As I said, we could perform challenge here to see whether we indeed had protective immunity. And the green line, and also here uh, in the green box, was the lead regimen, the lead candidate vaccine regimen, double priming with a mixture of adenovectors expressing GACPOL and ENV, and double boosting with the same mixture of adenos in combination with a GP140 protein. With this regimen, we uh, had a 94% per exposure risk reduction and full protection after six challenges in 66% of animals uh, that were in the study. And if you are interested, and I hope you are, you should attend the symposium tomorrow where Dan Baruch will elaborate on this data. And I, the, the flyers are outside uh, because I will refer to that symposium for other aspects of our program as well. So we had uh, passed the bar in non-human primate studies. We had sufficient uh, protection. And uh, now I will give you first an overview of the different clinical studies that are ongoing before I will disclose to you the data that we have obtained in the so-called approach study. 
So this is the design of approach. You can see here the elements, the components that were tested there, uh, the countries that were participating. Uh, the target uh, participant number was 400, so we had 50 individuals per vaccine regimen, per so vaccine arm that we tested. Uh, Jensen was the sponsor, and you can see here below the partners that were either funding or contributing in with expertise and knowledge uh, or with clinical sites and, and testing of, of clinical samples. The other study that is currently ongoing is the Traverse study where we are uh, testing uh, the fourth vector. So here we have uh, the, the actual regimen that we are aiming for with four adeno-26 uh, vectors and for uh, consistency and, and uh, uh, because we want to move this forward in the proof of concept study. We are comparing that with the uh, regimen that we have tested in the approach study. And then finally we have the so-called ascent study where we are comparing uh, one protein in the boost versus two proteins in the boost and that study is also ongoing. Um, so uh, of course we had to predefine our criteria uh, for go no go so based on uh, uh, the data that we that we had and would generate whether we would proceed into a proof of concept study. So the selection of criteria was based on the immune correlates of protection that we identified in the non-human primate studies and emphasis was on vaccine takers demonstrated by humoral and cellular immune responses, the magnitude of these responses and the functionality of elicited antibodies. And to do that we looked at uh, the, the monkey study uh, and we uh, compared animals that were infected or not infected after three challenges and we compared several immune parameters that could uh, that sort of correlated uh, with their infection status and it turned out that a certain level of antibody uh, titers um, that we could measure in ELISA and uh, cellular immune responses as measured by ELISPOT, if they were above a certain threshold, then we had the magnitude of non-infected uh, animals in that, uh, in that uh, part of the graph. So we could set uh, these uh, criteria based on monkey data. In addition, from uh, correlate analysis, we observed that ADCP, which stands for antibody-dependent cellular phagocytosis, was a correlate of protection in the, in the animals, and we also took that along as one of the criteria in the uh, go-no-go -no -go decision for moving into POC studies. And this will be uh, discussed in much more detail in the symposium tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., and I assume there will be breakfast there, so another reason to come. Um, so the go-no-go -go criteria towards proof of concept based on approach are listed here. So for the, uh, we wanted to have at least a certain percentage of responders for a humoral and cellular immunity. Uh, we wanted to see a fold increase of the booster dose uh, and we wanted to have certain magnitude uh, of the responses that were supportive for our decision to move along. So the, the percentages of responses are sh responders are shown here. So for humoral responders, uh, as measured in an uh, ELISA with uh, clade C antigen as uh, the, the, the target antigen, we wanted to have 90% of uh, participants responding. For ADCP, we wanted to see 56% of responders. For ELISPOT, uh, we wanted to see 50% res of responders. In the lead regimen, uh, so adeno prime, adeno plus envelope, protein boost, we wanted to see a contribution of the protein in the boost to be at least 1.5 fold higher than the regimen where we have only had the adeno mixture in the boost. And for the magnitude criteria, uh, let's focus on post dose 4. Uh, we wanted to have 75% of participants to have at least a 2.15 log 10 uh, Ellie spot uh, titer and a 3.8 uh, uh, antibody titer against clade C in, as measured in the uh, ELISA. Uh, and then we had another criteria that we at least wanted to have 60% of individuals who were at or above <coughs> both criteria that we had preset. Um, this is the uh, schema of the different regimens that we tested. So all individuals received two primes with at 26 uh, with the GAC poll and ENV mosaic inserts. Uh, we had at week 24 the uh, discriminating booster doses. So here the groups start to differentiate uh, in, in, in regimen. Uh, very briefly, uh, one group received at 26 with high dose protein, at 26 low dose protein, at 26 alone, MVA with high dose or low dose protein, MVA alone or protein alone at high dose. 
And first booster dose was given at week 24, the second at week 48, and we have immunodata at week 28, so four weeks post third dose, and week 52, which is four weeks post fourth dose. In the graphs that I will show uh, later on, the, the legend is uh, shown as here, so everybody received at 26, so that's the same before the slash, and then after that you see what the composition of the two booster doses uh, was. Um, the protein that we gave was adjuvanted with, uh, adjuvated with alum. So first, uh, one of the criteria of the, or one of the objectives of the study was safety. Um, uh, the, all regimens had a very favorable uh, safety profile, and I refer to uh, Frank Tomaka, who I just saw in the audience, but uh, he probably sat down. Uh, if you have additional questions on the, on the safety uh, profiles of our vaccine regimens, I refer you to him. He's the clinical leader of this program. So then, the data. Um, so all vaccine regimens that we tested were very immunogenic. We had 100% uh, responders in all but uh, one arm where we had 98. So I think very impressive uh, responses, responses uh, as measured by uh, antibodies against TP140 uh, clade C envelope. Uh, there was a clear contribution of GP140 in the boost and also this uh, appeared to be dose dependent. And uh, interestingly, we also had a clear contribution of the vector in the boost, so the combination of vector and protein together uh, uh, turned out best. So here all are all the groups uh, shown. In blue is the, uh, the baseline for all groups together because we, we uh, of course, could uh, add, add up the, the findings there. The regimen, the lead regimen, so double priming with a mix of at 26 and boosting with at 26 plus protein, uh, at high dose is uh, in the blue square, and you can see that uh, for this parameter, the uh, magnitude of the human response was superior. Uh, and and uh, yeah, very, of course, we were very happy that we could confirm that this immunogenicity was uh, uh, very high because it confirmed the data that we had seen in the monkeys where this actual regimen was most protective. In this uh, graph, you see uh, again the post dose three data in green, and now we've added the post dose four data in blue. Uh, you can see that uh, we maintained the number of responders post fourth vaccination and even had a slight increase in ELISA titers in most groups that had GP140 in the booster dose. And uh, very important, uh, I only show you the data for responses against clade C, but also cross-clade responses to other uh, uh, proteins of other clades were, uh, showed significant uh, responder patterns. So um, very much uh, on target. Um, just that, that you understand, so the, the, the orange circles are non-responders, so those were individuals that often already had a titer uh, prior to vaccination, that's false positives, and the red dots are the non-responders post those four. On the uh, right part, you can see the placebos that, that behaved very nicely. And this is the lead regimen. Then for functionality of the antibodies, all vaccine regimens elicited ADCP responses. And again, there was a clear contribution of GP140 in the booster dose, and this was again dose uh, dependent. Here you can see our lead regimen uh, behaving uh, uh, very uh, well, desirable, let's put it that way. Uh, finally, the cellular immune responses, uh, again, post third and fourth uh, dose, the ELI spot, and you can see uh, here the, the lead regimen. Also, for uh, cellular immune responses, the vaccine regimens were all very immunogenic with high percentage of responders in most groups. The highest immunogenicity was observed in the uh, groups that had a booster with uh, at 26 plus protein or MVA uh, plus protein, so the vectors uh, clearly contributed to cellular immunity and uh, responses were maintained or even slightly increased post fourth dose in the nv spot uh, responses. So going back to the preset go no go criteria and now filling in the information that we have observed, you can see that we uh, very nicely uh, uh, exceeded the preset criteria. We had 100% of responders uh, for uh, antibodies measured in ELISA, 80% of responders uh, for ADCP, 83% uh, of uh, participants uh, responded for cellular responses and this is all for the, the lead uh, uh, regimen. Uh, we had an almost seven-fold increase uh, of uh, 
uh, antibody titers by having the protein in the boost, so there is a reason to keep the protein there. And uh, we had 93% of individuals that met uh, the preset uh, magnitude criteria, uh, one or the other, and we even had 80% uh, of individuals that met both uh, magnitude criteria that we had preset. So we are very happy that we could tick all the boxes and that, uh, at least based on this data, we have reason to uh, uh, be optimistic uh, to proceed uh, to a proof of concept study. Of course, we are waiting for the data that will come out of the Traverse study where we are testing the uh, actual uh, uh, vaccine composition with four valent adeno uh, and we hope to uh, have that data ready in uh, the third or fourth quarter of this year so that we can uh, proceed to the already mentioned proof of concept study, HPX208 or also named HVTN705. Um, Glenda already alluded to the design of the study and also here I would like again to promote, uh, and I have nothing to add now because I already mentioned the breakfast, but um, Susan uh, Bookbinder will uh, elaborate on the details of that study and uh, we are all very excited. Uh, that, that it may happen. I would like to acknowledge all the uh, collaborators of this study. I already mentioned specifically Dan Baruch, but I'm happy to do it again. I want to uh, acknowledge uh, dates uh, for very generous funding uh, throughout the years and uh, sp uh, specifically mention Mike Penchero, who has been a great uh, uh, supporter of our program as a program manager and you can see all the uh, other institutions that are uh, participating. I would like to acknowledge my uh, fantastic colleagues at, uh, at Jensen. I uh, would like to uh, mention again Frank Tomaka who is clinical leader of the program and uh, Maria Grazia Pau who is the compound development team leader. I want to thank all the uh, principal investigators, sites and volunteers that participate in our studies. And last but not least, I would like to mention Paul Stoffels, who is uh, our great leader. And uh, without his support, we would not be where we are today. Thank you. We have time for one short question. So thank you very much. So I have one question. So are you going to uh, examine the cross reactivity of the antibodies binding to the uh, GPN40 derived from uh, other strains of HIV? Yes. So, so I, I did not show it, but we, we do have similar responses to uh, other clades that we tested. So we have a, a, a quite extensive panel of, of uh, MF antigens to demonstrate the cross hopefully, well, at least cross-reactivity, hopefully cross-protection. Okay. Our next speaker is uh, Patrice Dewey from uh, Paris, who is going to talk about BAC 3S, a new um, GP41 vaccine. Okay, this is my <coughs> conflict of interest. So we started with an enigma, which is that most of the cells which are dying during the chronic phase of the disease are non-infective cells. And for years now, we are focused on a small peptide, six amino acid peptide, which is highly conserved between, and that you can see here, between HR1 and HR2 at the viral membrane and which is uh, close to the uh, prefusion structures of HIV uh, spike. Uh, for some uh, years now, we have shown that this small motif is targeting the GC1QR, inducing a signal which makes, sorry, inducing a signal which makes the, the translocation of a new ligand, which is a ligand for NKP44. NKP44 is an active activator receptor of NK cells, so that cells which express NKP44 ligand are killed by NK cells. And we showed that during HIV infection, a large proportion of non-infected cells express NKP44L. Antibodies which could be raised in uh, mouse, in uh, rabbits, in monkeys, and even in humans can completely suppress this phenomenon. So we started from that to make vaccines in coupling the peptide to a carrier protein, which is a diphtheria toxoid, and trying to see if it could induce the pathogenesis. In a series of monkey data, which I won't show, we showed that, in fact, either in prevention or in therapeutic, you can completely suppress 
CD4 T cell depletion during uh, Shiv infection. So the protocol which I will show you is in the follow-up of these uh, discoveries. This is a clinical studies, a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled phase two studies. As you can see, um, the vaccine have been administered with Allen, four arms, six, 32, 64 micrograms. Should note that the 62 arm have not been boosted. The boost have been done three boosts three times at four weeks interval, then three boosts at 12 weeks intervals, and there is two endpoints. These endpoints at 12 weeks, and there is a follow-up at 48 weeks. This is the flow chart showing you that 112 patients were eligible, 86 were randomized <coughs> and completed 85, and that you can see that the patients. Uh, have been uh, um, randomly um, spread into the various arms uh, with uh, the same type of numbers. The primary objective was in fact to evaluate the overall immunocity at 3S at the dose of 16 and 32 micrograms. I remember that the 92 have been only uh, uh, done for the primary injection and not for the boost. Uh, and that the secondary objectives were to assess the safety and to assess the impact of uh, vacuous immunotherapy and CD4 cell counts and the percentage in the cohort of individuals which have been virologically controlled with stable CD4 T cell counts. So this is the inclusion criteria. The individuals have a documented HIV infection. They were adults between 18 to 60 years of age. They were on stable antiviral therapy that is constant with the current standard of care. They have been on antiviral therapy for at least 12 months prior the study screening. The plasma RNA was minus 50 copies per human during the previous 12 months. And the CD cell T cell counts at the screening were between 200 and 500 cells per cubic millimeters. As you can see here from the demographic, there is no difference between the sex, between age, between ethnic origin, between body mass, uh, uh, between uh, uh, CD4 cell counts, CD4, CD8 ratio, between the free for Nadir and HIV duration during the, the old groups which means doing the groups which have been injected with 16 microgram, 32 microgram, 64 microgram, and the placebo. And you can see that the CD cell counts overall were between 340 and 370 uh, CD40 cells, while the HIV duration was between 12 to uh, 15 years uh, of duration. There, concerning the safety inclusion, there are no related serious effects events. There is no serious effects leading to death. There is just some mostly local pains, as you can see, or erythema or edema, and uh, other, some other minor related adverse events like asthenia, pyrexia, and mangia. The primary endpoint, as you can see here, showed that in the four injected arms, there was an increase of antibody level, which you can see here from baseline, which is highly significant at week 12, uh, at 16, 32, 64, whereas, as you can see here, there is no differences between the placebo. And there are differences between all groups, as shown here, with a highly significant p-value. You can see here also uh, showing that between 16 and 32 micrograms, there are no great differences and that you can obtain a plateau at week 24. Uh, remember that uh, the individuals which have been injected with 64 micrograms have been only uh, primed with no boost, but the level which have been obtained is a little bit less than the two others. So these uh, 16 and 32 micrograms seems to be the best, whereas as you can see there is no increase in, in the placebo groups. This is a, a postdoc analysis where in fact we divided uh, the individuals between high responders, low responders, and non-responders. In fact, the low responders correspond to a four-fold increase in anti-3S at two consecutive type points. This is the usual conventional uh, uh, level which is uh, need to be obtained in the vaccines. But we also isolate the high responders 
which are more than tenfold increase in anti s at two consecutive points. And this, is, this was chosen because in the macaque experiments, uh, the titles which were required to, for the uh, experiments to work were ten times more the, the basic uh, level which could be obtained. You can see here that between uh, 45 to 60 percent individual globally responds and can be equally divided between low and high responders. Here we show the biological maskers at baseline. You can see that there is no difference in HIV duration, no difference in the CD40 cell nadir, no difference in the age at the inclusion. But as could be expected, in fact, uh, the more CD4 cells the individuals have at the baseline, the higher titers of antibodies could then be acquired. And you can see here that there is differences between high and low respondents and between the known respondents depending on the level of CD40 cells at the baseline. Here, as the biological effect of, <laughs> of the vaccines, I hope it's not the vaccine, neither my talk, which shows you that, in fact, uh, there is uh, the, the high responders significantly, uh, highly significantly increase their CD4 cell counts at week uh, 48 when compared to, to baseline. And there is no difference in low responders, non responders, and the placebo. And you can see that uh, at week, it, sorry, it was at week 12. And you can see that similarly at week 45, there is also a highly significant increase in CD40 cells in high responders, where you can see that there is no response in low respond, no increase in low responders, non-responders, and placebo. In that slide, you show that there is a nice correlation with the highly significant p-value between the amount of antibody titers which I found and the delta of CD40 cells, indicating that the more antibodies you have, the higher increase in CD40 cells that you may have. So, in, in conclusion, we showed that 3S immunogenic with approximately 45 to 62 responders after six injections of 16 or 32 of vaccine, that there were two types of responders, those which have more than 12-fold change at two consecutive points, and those which are more than four-fold change at two consecutive points, that immunocompetent HIV patients with high CD4, CD8 ratio respond better to VAX3S, that high respondents significantly increase their CD4 cell counts, about 60 CD40 cells per millimeter cubed after vaccination compared to baseline, and that there is significant correlation between the delta CD4 cell counts from baseline and the full change of S3S uh, in, in all vaccines. And that to me seems in fact to confirm the hypothesis that this is, uh, 3S is a target which is early inferring with CD40 cell drop and which could be counteracted by antibodies directed against this, uh, this epitope. So uh, the whole uh, trial was coordinated by uh, Christine Catlamar, who is the PI, uh, I forget to say that there have been 10 centers in France, one in Germany, one in Spain. The medical monitor was uh, Bob Murphy, and, and the sponsor of this trial was uh, Inavivax. And the uh, uh, data analysis have been made by Jean-Christophe Lemarier and Basile Combardier and Vincent Veillard from our lab who are working on this project. Thank you. Questions? So, I'm just wondering why, why do you think it's a 64 dose is so low I mean, in terms of response rate? I don't know, but remember they have been, not been boosted, so it might be only due to the priming. But if you compare just the priming, it's true that it's, it's less than 32. I don't know. I have no idea about that. You, you should notice that the adjuvant which was used was Allen. Whereas in the monkeys, we used also uh, CFA, which is a little bit different because it's a different type of adjuvant. 
Julia Maria Corbelli from the European Health Treatment Group. Sorry to put it in a very simple way so to, to, uh, uh, that I'm sure I understand well. The, this vaccination works well, better uh, at least, in those who are already immunocompetent, if, I'm, if I could understand well. Yeah, which is uh, conceivable, in fact, because the, more, the highest defense cell you have, the better you can make an amount of immune response. But again, the adjuvant we produced was Allen, so you can probably gain much more with another type of adjuvant which we are working on. Ah, okay, thank you. Have you been trying to isolate monoclonals from the... This well, this is also a, a possibility. Remember also that in the monkey experiments what we did is that you could uh, use that either in prophylaxis or in therapeutic. And if you use that in prophylaxis in the monkeys, there is no CD4 cell expression of uh, infection with SHIV. Okay. So, <coughs> next speaker is Dr. Robin Shatu. Bonjour. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak to you this morning. And I'm going to talk to you about experimental medicine trials. That's what I, the, the brief that I've been given. And why do we think this is an important strategy at the moment? Well, obviously, while Glenda and Hanukkah are studying their perfect vaccines in this renaissance of vaccinology period that we're in, if they fail to realize the level of efficacy that the investigators might hope to reach, we need some alternatives in the pipeline, either to improve on those results that we may, may see, or to provide alternative strategies. So it's prudent to be able to have approaches that can continue the pipeline, irrespective of what the findings of the trials are. And if they're spectacular, well, we can move on to something else. So what do we mean when we talk about experimental medicine studies? These are not different from phase one studies. They're still about safety, but they're specifically designed to test hypotheses, and they don't have the purview of being part of a product development strategy. That means that in some ways they can move faster and be smaller scale, um, and that allows uh, uh, us to accelerate some of the things moving into clinical trials. Why are they important? Well, I think increasingly we're beginning to understand that animal models, while extremely useful, do not necessarily predict the type of antibody response that's required, particularly for broadly neutralizing antibody responses. And that's partly to do with having differences in germline, uh, germline encoded antibody precursors. And a beautiful example of of some of the differences is provided by the recent paper of Devin sitting in the front here, looking at cows who make these fantastic antibody responses very quickly with broadly neutralizing uh, activity. Now clearly, if humans were cows, we wouldn't be here because we'd have solved the problem already. Um, and so increasingly it's important, and I think the field recognizes, that we need human immunogenicity readouts of many of these new antigens to be able to inform um, how we move forward. And this is very different from classical vaccinology, which really has as a gatekeeper a lot of the preclinical models. Now I think increasingly we're seeing that some of these preclinical models should run paraclinically with human trials so we can see where they inform and where they are differences. So it's not weakening the preclinical setup, it's actually reinforcing and getting the best out of both animal models and the human model. Um, financially it's important as well because I think increasingly there will be a pressure on the field. It will be harder to put more and more candidates into large efficacy trials, both as budgets may be squeezed, but also as other prevention technologies become better and better. For an efficacy trial, it will be a, a, a bigger spend because the trials will need to get bigger as incidence comes down. So as we look forward, we need to have better candidates. When I say better candidates, that reduce the risk of failure. Um, and everything is obviously a moment in time. So what you choose to go into the clinic now, the things that we're seeing in the clinic right now, were started many years ago. So the field is constantly changing. 
Um, logistically, we still urgently need a, an HIV vaccine that's going to be out there. And so that sense of urgency st still needs to be maintained by the field. And then ethically, um, obviously, we want, don't want to expose people to vaccines in large efficacy trials that don't necessarily have the best chance at that moment in time of giving us a successful endpoint. And so being able to... Uh, being able to refine um, vaccines early in the pipeline makes obvious sense. So what might you want to look at? Well, obviously, in terms of experimental trials, they should be designed to accelerate and decrease the risk of late-stage failure. They should be designed to address uh, questions that are not really able to be addressed definitively in animal models. So that would be particularly looking at antibody repertoire responses. Um, they should be able to facilitate crosstalk between preclinical and clinical approaches, um, enable uh, validation and sequential iterations for structural design. I mean, there's been, a, if we talk about Renaissance, there has been an extreme uh, blossoming of structural based designs, and the bottleneck right now is getting those design concepts into humans and understanding whether they're actually delivering what we need in terms of human immunogenicity. Obviously good for hypothesis testing um, and providing very uh, in detailed depth analysis of immune repertoire response and increasingly involving intense uh, sampling which is not really uh, feasible on large scale trials. So looking at lots of different, different compartments, taking samples in a very intense uh, time related fashion to look at the immune response as it evolves. Now, we, we know that the, there are lovely examples of how broadly neutralizing antibodies can involve in HIV-infected patients, and the goal for the field really is trying to uh, induce that in humans. We have no vaccine currently that induces any uh, neutralizing antibodies of any breadth in humans, and so a lot of work needs to be done to be able to start changing um, uh, immunization schedules that may go out for many years into uh, types of schedules that would be applicable in a real-world setting. So uh, what about the road ahead and the, the strategies that are coming into the clinic? I don't have the time to go into these in great detail. I would recommend to those of you who weren't there last night to uh, go back and see the very nice presentation by Rohir Saunders on all the new concepts that are coming through the pipeline. Um, it was uh, put together by the enterprise, and I'm told that's going to be online very soon. So if you want to get the detail, that is the talk to go and listen to. But the type of approaches really are three main strategies, one based on uh, structural proteins, recombinant proteins, whether they're monomers in a lineage design approach, um, but increasingly looking at these more sophisticated, highly designed trimers that look like the native uh, type of uh, envelope protein um, that can now be manufactured to scale. Um, increasingly, people are also looking at epitope mimics, um, particularly the work of Bill Sheath, looking at trying to prime the germline and coax the immune system along to giving antibodies of breadth, and then using lots of different vector and nucleic acid approaches to try and, again, increase the number of concepts that can get into human clinical trials. I'm just going to give you a couple of very, very short examples because of the time constraints. Um, obviously, all of these different approaches are not mutually exclusive. U ultimately, they need to be looked in, in combination. And when you start to stack up the range of different opportunities for looking at combinations, again, you need to be very nimble in terms of getting these into human studies. Um, traditionally, these would be possible in primate studies, and primate studies are not without cost. Obviously, getting them to humans is a another level of complexity. So one of the approaches that, uh, again, you would have heard a lot about last night is using some of these very native-like, highly structured proteins um, that appear to represent what's actually expressed on, uh, native, uh, on, on the wild-type virus. Um, and these really allow us to look at the immune response in fine detail to some of these uh, really nice structurally designed proteins. Um, we can move further and uh, working with Quentin Satantau and other groups, these can be further stabilized to see whether stabilization of the protein structure is really important for inducing the type of immune response that's required to elicit uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies. 
This is just a, a, a list of some of the questions that I think are pressing clinical needs, but it's only really a very small summary. I'm sure you could come up with a much greater list. But increasingly, we still need to look at intervals, intervals of immunization to enhance somatic hypermutation, uh, dose and prime boost uh, effects, um, looking at fractional dosing, looking at uh, in increasing or decreasing dosing strategies, um, a range of adjuvants that may be also able to shift the immune response in the right direction, the impact of roots on, again, the antibody induction, uh, B cell memory and durability is something that still um, is challenging the HIV community in terms of getting sustained antibody responses. That's probably also linked to looking at the quality of T helper follicular cells. Um, and again, that can only really be done in a human setting. Um, looking at the longevity of protein only versus vector prime protein boost approaches will be critical. Um, understanding how uh, new proteins in these contexts talk to the human germline B cell repertoire is really probably in terms of a renaissance where things are going to happen in the next five to ten years, I believe. And then obviously antigen presentation, the way we present these proteins, will be critical to the induced immune response. So the major bottleneck for this is in terms of actually producing proteins um, and manufacturing because it's not without cost. And you can see this nice little picture, um, and I think a few of the guys waiting to get through are probably just going to turn around and give up. So unless we can actually um, open the gate and get things to translate into humans faster, many concepts are not going to see the light of day in terms of being assessed against human immunogenicity. So one of the approaches is to make things fit quicker and faster is to look at using nucleic acid approaches, whether that's DNA or RNA, um, and also uh, some of the vectors that can be manufactured faster and quicker. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples here. You can, if you deliver DNA in the right way, uh, here looking at a clinical trial, de delivering it with electroporation, elicit an antibody response that's sufficient to, tr to study the repertoire of B cells that are responding to the vaccine. So this level of immune response would not be suitable for a protective vaccine. That's not the point here. It would be suitable to look at what type of, an uh, what type of antibodies are being made and what their specificity is. This is cheap, it can be done fast, um, and it allows a lot of concepts to be assessed um, in a relatively timely fashion. Here's another approach using DNA to perhaps look at a lineage design approach and push the B cell repertoire in the right direction, low cost, and then coming back with a generic protein to amplify the response. And you can see, uh, hopefully, the very thin dotted line on that second graph shows the response with DNA alone. You can see you get this massive boost with a single protein boost. This protein was without adjuvant. So with adjuvant, you might augment it further. But again, in terms of studying what's happening in the B cell uh, environment, this gives a very nice approach to be able to look and drill down into that. Now, the advantages of using nucleic acid or vectors are that they, they can be relatively cheap and quick, and you can also express the protein in a membrane context, which may make it more native-like. The disadvantage is you have no uh, ability to purify that protein, so you have to engineer it so that it has the stability and, it, uh, and is expressed in a native light way, um, and you can't guarantee that that's going to be the case. So there's some, some, str some strengths and weaknesses in the approach. The other approach is to look at manufacturing the trimers and to try and come up with a manufacturing pipeline that is sufficiently nimble um, and cost effective to get things into trials uh, faster. So we've been looking at this in, in our uh, European context um, and we've come up with a, a process where we can generate, um, we're making up to eight trimers over a five year period. Um, I think we have a turnaround time of 12 months from putting it into the pipeline to getting it out and we're turning out um, a recombinant protein about once every six months. Now that's on a limited budget and it's not sustainable because of the funds um, in terms of the, the, the nature of funding going up and down, but it shows that these approaches are now uh, uh, achievable for uh, academic and commercial investigators. 
Some of the things that one can do, this is, a, this is my final example, this is not with a native-like protein, this is taking a, an old school trimer, but looking at some of the impacts of intervals. We were interested to look at whether having a late boost versus an early boost, so six months versus 12 months, would impact on the induced immune response. So these top two graphs, group A was boosting at six, um, and group B was boosting at 12 months. Um, and you can see in terms of the uh, magnitude of the response that there isn't very much difference. But when we start to drill down into the uh, specificity of the isotypes, um, we start to see some interesting um, things that are coming up. Obviously, if you're interested in ADCC, you'd be interested in the IgG3 response. That's at the bottom in the purple color. You can see that the IgG3 response is really very hard to sustain. An IgG3 re IgG responses tend to be early responses uh, to vaccination or infection are not robust. Um, we're all uh, interested in terms of sustaining antibody responses, and I think the other thing from this graph which is interesting is if you look at the red line, that's an IgG1 response, and you can see it has that sawtooth rapid tail off. If you look at the green line, that's an IgG2 response, and that's much more sustained. Now, I'm not arguing for us to make an IgG2 response necessarily functionally, but understanding why that isotype is sustained for prolonged periods versus the IgG2 may start to allow us to assess um, what's important in terms of sustaining antibody responses. So that just gives you an example of how a very small trial, this had 12 participants, starts to generate new hypotheses, raise new questions, and may uh, uh, open up new uh, avenues of research to solving some of the issues that are challenging the community. This is the, the pipeline of what we're doing in Europe in terms of the top getting trimers uh, into some small-scale immunogenicity studies. We have three phases of those. Um, you will hear from our next speaker um, some efforts to, to get T-cell vaccine approaches into clinical trials. Um, and we also heard yesterday that the NIH has a range of studies planned uh, for the end of this year and the beginning of next year working on the BG505 SOSIPs. So there are many things coming through now into small experimental medicine studies. And I think increasingly as we, as we look forward, not just in HIV, but in vaccinology in general, there will be an increased emphasis on studying human immunogenicity. And I think what the field is hoping to look, look to is actually to be able to close the loop so that we can link structural design to human immunogenicity and have an iterative cycle where the human response can feed back into the structural biology and we can design better immunogens to elicit the type of responses that we need to achieve. So I will finish there, obviously acknowledge the funders of the, the current and ongoing work and thank you for your attention. So thank you very much. So questions from Rob? Robin, very nice talk. Uh, quick question about, in following up with some of the comments that Eve Levy made in the uh, plenary about the role of inflammation and thinking about in the global population basis as we look across in these small proof of concept studies across many groups and populations, how do you look at the role of underlying inflammation or different underlying conditions in populations, how they might affect the outcomes of these studies? So most of these studies will be done in, in low-risk individuals, so we're not looking in the context of potentially enhancing uh, an inflammatory response that might enhance transmission rates. Um, or it's really about discovery of the right immunogens, and the type of approaches that I'm talking about are probably low risk in terms of inflammation. We're talking about injectable vaccines, DNA, RNA, protein with adjuvants, um, and those probably come with less of a risk <coughs> than moving downscale to some of the more inflammatory vectors, particularly replicating uh, vectors, where more care um, may, may need to be in place to ensure the safety of those types of approaches. If I understood correctly, I think you were talking largely about uh, preventive vaccines, and I was intrigued by your comment that you can make a DNA vaccine induce <coughs> antibodies. Is, 
and you know, you think of a DNA vaccine normally doing T cell responses. Is there a, a magic way to get them to do both, or is it really either or? So it's not either or, either or. In all of those studies I didn't present, they're making T cell responses. Now they're making T cell responses against the envelope protein, so how useful those are in a therapeutic context is questionable, but it, it's really, we've taken an approach that's designed to make T cell responses and does, um, and managed to reconfigure or push it in a way that we can study the B cell response. Do you get IG3, IgG3 out of a DNA vaccine? It, de ADCC it depends stuff? on how you deliver it. So okay. if you deliver it you in later. that context, then you could get an IgG3 response. Hi, Robin. Um, I completely agree that uh, you with your graph about the constraint of GMP manufacturing. So I was curious out of your polyimmune efforts, what kind of cost profile are you getting with your ARM production? Um, I, can't, I can't reveal what we are having to pay in terms of costs. Um, because that's confidential information. Um, but our budget is modest compared to some, uh, uh, some approaches that I have seen um, in terms of manufacture. Now, obviously, the context is important. This is an academic collaboration, um, and so uh, our relationship is not one that is commercially driven in terms of making profit from making those products. Any other questions? So thank you very much. So next speaker is Dr. Thomas Hanke. Please. Sorry, I've been Macintoshed. <laughs> right, so I'd like to thank the organizers for <clears throat> giving me the opportunity to talk. And our aim <clears throat> is, to in, is to induce effective cytotoxic T cells, and effective is still the important word in the title. This can complement broadly neutralizing antibodies for prevention, and effective cytotoxic T cells might be key for therapy. So what seems to be clear, at least to us, is that more of the same CTL is not going to work. So natural infection induces vigorous T cell response, which doesn't protect. Past T cell vaccines using full lens proteins, including GEC, the most conserved and promising, fail to protect. Just reactivating T cells that fail to control HIV prior to antiretroviral treatment is not going to work because HIV has already escaped these T cells. So we have to do something different. So the biggest challenge for both for antibodies and uh, T cell induction are HIV diversity and escape. And uh, there are various approaches how to deal with uh, variability. Our strategy is to focus uh, the T cells induced by vaccines on the conserved regions of uh, the, the HIV uh, proteome. These conserved regions are common to most variants, and mutation in these regions are typically associated with uh, replicative fitness cost. So we are targeting HIV where it hurts. So the first generation concert vaccines were uh, designed uh, using the conserved regions highlighted on this slide uh, in GEC, in Paul, and we also included two envelope uh, regions. We used clade consensus for each region, and we alternated the major global clades in order to have a uh, equal clade representation. We have inserted a synthetic gene coding for this immunogen uh, to lots of different uh, vaccine modalities, and three of them reached the clinical evaluation, and the trials are listed below. The top four are uh, in HIV uh, negative individuals as a prophylactic effort, and the bottom four are in HIV positive individuals 
as part uh, of developing cure and I'm going to show you briefly data from uh, these four trials so for prevention the first time we tested these vaccines in um, <coughs> Uh, HIV negative individuals was in HIV negative adults in Oxford. We have DNA MVH in Adeno. We had three different combinations, eight vaccine recipients plus two placebos. So first of all, 100% everybody vaccine recipient responded to the vaccination. No placebo responded to the vaccination. We have induced median uh, responses Arispot responses um, over 5,000 Arispots. The two most immunogenic were the CM, the Chimp Adeno Prime MVA Boost, and the DDD CM, so DNA priming, Chimp Adeno, and MVA. These immune responses lasted at least two years, and after two years in fresh ex vivo um, Arispots, the median in those individuals who came back was 600 early spots. So this compares favorably to the STEP study. Because these conserved regions are naturally subdominant, and if we take them out of the context and, and use efficient vaccine delivery as Chimp and Abraham MVA Boost, we are inducing novel epitopes, and indeed in the first vaccines that we look at, we have identified 28 novel epitopes which haven't been described before. This is going to be important for, for instance, early uh, indication of vaccine efficacy. So the second trial, we then took this strategy to Africa, to HIV negative adults. Again, we uh, tried to repeat the two most immunogenic regimens and we also used electroporation for the DNA. Again, 100% responders or vaccine recipients responded to the vaccination. Median was between two to 3,000 early spots. The DNA, you can see, increases the DNA uh, responses, but 44 at week 44 or 24 weeks after the MVA, these responses are not distinguishable, even though it doesn't mean for instance, priming with DNA doesn't increase high avidities through a low antigen priming. As far, of, uh, as, far as the breads, we have six peptide pools across the immunogen. And uh, if you look at the individuals, how many different pools they responded in these regimens, the median was six peptide pools, so we're inducing broad immune responses. These are early spots. Of course, the most relevant assay is in vitro virus inhibition. IRV has developed a panel of eight different viruses of different clades and types and tropisms and origins. And the T cells that we have induced in these African volunteers inhibited six out of these eight volunteers significantly. And uh, the green again is, is adenoprime MVA boost and the pink is DNA, adeno MVA, blue is electroporated, and the white are placebo. So six viruses inhibited significantly, and the two viruses which were not inhibited significantly, there is a clear trend of inhibition. Clearly different viruses have different uh, difficulties or are differently inhibitable. So as for HIV cure, we have tested uh, the immunogenicity for the first time in uh, individuals infected and treated early within one week after diagnosis, stable for six months, and then they received this first generation Chimp Adenoprime MVA boost. And uh, then two to three years later, we have invited these uh, patients back, they received MVA, three doses of romidepsin and MVA, and eight weeks later, we stopped the antiretroviral treatment. And uh, individuals would be put back on antiretroviral treatment if they have two consecutive RNA measurements of 2,000 copies per mil. This trial is in going. So first of all, 100% responders again. Uh, everybody who received the vaccination 
responded. These are very briefly the immunogenicity. So if you look at BCN01, we have induced median of 900 um, early spots. And this is now on frozen uh, samples. Then two to three years later, these responses went down, but were nicely boosted with the first MVA. And the second MVA actually boosted even further. If you look at the refocusing, these are on the left, starting from the naive. So the whole cake is the, the total HIV responses. And the little wedge there, 6%, were directed against the conserved regions present in the vaccine. By the time we finished the BCN, O2 immunizations, the two MVAs, two-thirds of the total HIV responses were refocused and were now uh, targeting the conserved regions of HIV. We have uh, interestingly reactivated the virus just by giving the MVA in 60% of volunteers, but after romidepsin, all patients had detectable virus load. In terms of uh, the latent virus pool, the latent virus pool decreased, but it was consistent with the time on antiretroviral treatment. We didn't uh, see any additional benefit from receiving the vaccination or romidepsin. So eight weeks after the last MVA, we stopped the antiretroviral treatment in uh, 13 individuals, and eight of them rebounded uh, with the typical kinetics of two to four weeks after stopping antiretroviral treatment. Five of these individuals, which is 38%, uh, were able to control the virus without antiretroviral treatment for longer. Of these five, one had to be put on the antiretroviral treatment eight weeks later. Four out of five still control the virus today, and it's over six months, which is 30%. You may know that uh, typically the spontaneous control is about 10 to 15 percent. So the conclusion for the BCNO2 is that we did not reduce the latent reservoir beyond what is expected from the time on antiretroviral treatment. The art free control in 38 percent of patients is, of course, encouraging but these are very preliminary data. We didn't have controls of nature control rates in this particular cohort. It was an open label study, non-randomized, limited um, sample size. Nevertheless, it's a hypothesis generating pilot study. We are also testing these vaccines in London. So this was in Barcelona, we're testing this. Uh, these vaccines also in London, where 60 patients early on antiretroviral treatment will be uh, put early on antiretroviral treatment, and half of them will receive uh, chimp anano prime and MVA boost and vorinostat. And in this trial at the moment, we only are going to look at the uh, levels of the latent HIV uh, reservoir, but we are uh, planning to get some money, especially in the light of Barcelona, uh, to give these patients MVA and stop antiretroviral treatment. So overall, the first generation of conserved region vaccines have proven the concept. So what is the concept? The concept is that if you take naturally subdominant epitopes out of the context of the full length proteins or virus, and deliver them even to HIV positive individuals using a potent heterogous prime boost regimen like the chimp anano prime MVA boost, which was pioneered by Adrian Hill in London. You can induce strong CDA T cell responses, which can inhibit replication of HIV in vitro of four major clades. We have second generation in manufacturing. We've got trials funded both in the HIV negative and HIV positive individuals. But unfortunately, there wasn't enough time to show you what, how the second, the second generation is designed, has been published, is designed as a bivalent mosaic focusing on the conserved region. So increasing the match 
of the vaccine to the circulating viruses. So lots of people uh, have contributed to these studies. Special thanks to the volunteers and to the funders. Thank you very much. So, questions from the floor? Have questions? So, first, regarding the uh, vaccine trials in HIV negative people, you show the uh, uh, in vitro viral inhibition efficacy. So, may maybe you have already published, but do you have any uh, association of in vitro viral inhibition efficacy with the uh, L spot magnitude or L spot target? Yes, we do have a, or have published a correlation that the higher the L spots, the better the inhibition. And we have done some studies looking at individual epitopes, and we have shown that epitopes from Paul are as good as epitopes from GEC in inhibiting HIV replication in vitro. So please. Thomas, yeah. Well, it's nice to see your continued progress uh, on this. But um, one question I have is, what, with the kind of breath that you got, which was, you know, looks impressively nice, what is it about those two strains in the viral inhibition assays that you see no activity? Well, we don't know. And uh, it's not how well the viruses grow in these individuals because the growth is that didn't correlate. And uh, it might be just like viruses for antibody inhibition or neutralization. There are different tiers, tier 1, tier 2, tier 3. It might be that for T cells, it's precisely the same. We may have tier 1, tier 2 viruses for T cell inhibition. But at the moment, we don't understand that. Yeah, your vaccine was immunogenic, and I'm intrigued that you did not get any decrease in the size of the reservoir. So I wonder if you know anything about the relationship between the immune responses you induced versus the antigens being presented by the reactivating cells once the people went off therapy. Yeah, so as I said, this study is ongoing. It's done single-handedly almost by Beatrice Mota in Barcelona. And uh, so all these, we're sequencing the viruses, we're looking at the immunological correlates, we're looking at everything we can, but I cannot present any data at this point. It will be coming in the next one or two years. So I have one more question. So regarding the vaccine in the HIV positive people, uh, you show after art, maybe four uh, people show the long-term control. And uh, I uh, agree with uh, your idea of the uh, inducing subdominant dead drops. And maybe uh, those people uh, in, uh, show the induction of uh, conserved epitospec T cell responses after vaccination. And my question is, uh, uh, during the control, how the targeting epitopes changed, or still those people show the conserved epitope specific T cell response? So again, at the moment, we only have the breadth as far as the six peptide pools that we're using. But again, mapping is going on of, of precisely which specificity we're inducing in whom. Of course, samples are going to be limited for everything what we want to do, but we are doing as much as we can to characterize the uh, immune responses that we have induced. So any other questions? So thank you very much. <laughs> so presentation by all the speakers has completed and uh, any question to all over this session or questions from the speakers? <laughs> so this session is uh, consistent of a variety of the uh, subjects. 
So, individual <coughs> discussion may be very good. And so, close, can I close? So, we'll close this session now. Thank you very much for the attention.